very grateful for all the questions that you sent through in your form when you signed up. We're going to cover as many of those as we can in, um, in their presentation this evening, uh, which is we're going to start with actually looking, giving a little bit of an overview of Human Given's approach, where it originated from and how it sits alongside other therapeutic approaches. And then we're going to go into more detail as to what's how the diploma course is taught, the structure, the, the, your journey through it, that kind of thing. And we'll have regular breaks for questions. Um, so hopefully everything that you want to know will be answered. Firstly, I'd like to introduce actually, Gareth Hughes is the college's ed educational director and, and um, a wealth of experience in education and mental health and wellbeing, particularly of students. And Joe Baker, also um, our diploma tutor. We've got various tutors teach the various different parts of the course but these um Gareth and Joe are the ones that speak teach the main part two element which is a, a core part of the whole diploma course as they'll go on to explain so Gareth and Joe I don't know if you'd like us to um hand over to you now good evening everyone and, and thank you very much for um for joining us this evening from from all over um and at all times of the day and um, we're, we're it's great to have so many people here and hopefully we'll make this um, session as useful as possible and provide you with as much information as we possibly can please do as you said uh, as um, Arlene was saying do drop messages in the Q&A or in the chat and we'll try and get to as many of those as we can throughout the session as well and if there's anything you haven't still got to then you can still email us afterwards and we'll do our best to get your question answered for you so we'll um, begin just by by introducing ourselves a little bit. As Jane said, I'm, I'm, my name is Gareth Hughes, um, and I'm joined by my colleague uh, Joe Baker here. And um, we're both um, human givens therapists, tutors, and supervisors. Um, and I don't know, Joe, if you want to begin introducing yourself and filling in your background in terms of human givens. Yeah, so I came into Human Givens um, in, I think I first started in 2009 with my first course. Um, and my background really, I'd, I'd trained in another modality prior to coming to, to HG. Um, and I came on a one day course and I just I just took um, took a one day course and was completely hooked um, and then signed up for the diploma. And Gareth and I actually did our uh, part two of the diploma together. Um, and have pretty much worked together since, haven't we? So it was really lovely and a, a huge privilege to come full circle and to come back and, and teach um, on the diploma, which has really shaped our, our careers. Absolutely. So my my life, I, I, I hadn't worked at all. I was originally working in the Hall of Residence. I hadn't worked in mental health at all at that point um, in a university. And I'd become interested in um, kind of the student mental health and what I was seeing within Hall's residence and, and gradually then started doing one or two of the human givens courses just to kind of up the skill level that I had so that I could work with the students that I was seeing and got more and more interested had never planned to train as a psychotherapist I always say to people it happened by accident one day I woke up and I was one but I had kind of gone through the human givens processes I'd done all the courses I'd done part two and and then qualified and, and that kind of opened up a whole career for me so my career since then has been focused still on student mental health, but I, these days I'm a, I'm a researcher um, and I've worked on developing um, ways to support students across the whole sector. So a lot of my work now is kind of at sector level within in UK universities. Um, we developed something called the University Mental Health Charter and I've developed guidance for academics and um, other colleagues who work within in universities. And so again, it was, it was lovely then to come back full circle back into the Human Givens College to take all the learning that I've done around teaching and learning and all that kind of stuff from within the university sector and bring it back into the college and, and, and to be teaching students and to kind of complete that circle has been great. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when you're first starting off um, for, for people, perhaps you're already a qualified um, therapist or counsellor or um, mental health um, professional um, and you're looking for, for some further development in your career or perhaps you're coming at it from a completely different um, career pathway. And there are so many different courses out there. Um, it can be a bit of a minefield um, when you're looking and you can read a lot online. Um, but really the idea of today is to give you a flavor of, of, of the way we work in HG and you know the way that the, the diploma will be taught. Um, and to, to kind of dispel um, 
any myths or allay any concerns that anybody might have about coming into this either from um, a different modality or from having no prior experience um, at all really so we'll do our best to answer um, any any questions from that and although I did train in a different modality before prior to that I my background was in accountancy so um, it, it just shows you know you can you can come at it from from any angle really it doesn't make a make a difference at all yeah so let's we're aware that people are coming to this from different angles we know from thank you all for the forms that you sent in as well that's been really helpful for us thinking about what might be useful for, for everybody today we know some of you have done one or two courses um some of you are coming to this completely fresh and won't have done anything with this so far so what we thought we'd do is we'd begin by just talking about human given therapy and, and where it sits in the therapy world and what makes it, it, it a little bit different from some of the other therapies that are out there and then we'll come on and talk about the diploma so if we begin by thinking about about the human givens ideas itself then and if you can just move the slides on for me then please joe um if we think about the, the the world of mental health at the moment and if you read about it and if you're interested in the research or you maybe you're picking stuff up in the media you'll know that there are, there's a huge debate within the mental health world about what is it that causes mental illness why is it that some people are mentally well and other people aren't what's going on with all of that and you can find lots of different explanations some people thinking that this is there must be a biological explanation and there must be a, a, something going on neurologically with people some looking at the environment and society and looking for issues there some people seeing it within relationships or seeing it as part of some physical cause um and some people thinking of that it's about you know things that happen in childhood and so you can get all these kind of different competing theories all of which have kind of some truth in them um and a number of years ago, what happened was Joe Griffin and Ivan Tyrrell were kind of looking at all of this and trying to work out, well, how can we find a way of explaining all this to people that's easy to understand and that actually puts some organizing idea around this, that actually is a way of answering all of the kind of th the evidence that we have out there of explaining everything that's going on and, and the apparent contradictions in, in some of it. And they kind of worked their way back through uh, all of the kind of the other therapies that are out there. They looked at the, the, all the different parts of the, those therapies that seem to work. They looked back through ancient wisdom. They looked at psychology, neurology, a whole range of things to kind of come to, well, what are the kind of core things we can actually work with back at the very beginning of this? And what they started to think about is, well, if you think about psychotherapy, it's there to help people who are in distress is, is, is largely why people would think about using it. So the thing was, OK, so who are people? What are people then? Well, people are human beings. And human beings are living things. And what we know about all living things is that all living things have needs. Everything that's alive needs to take nutrition from its environment. If you think about a flower, it needs to take water, it needs to take sunlight, it needs nutrition from the soil. And all living things are the same. And the more complex the living thing, the more complex its needs are. And when our needs are met in balance, we're healthy and we function and we flourish. But when we don't, when we're unable to meet our needs for whatever reason, then actually we start to experience problems and we start to go into distress and that can show up physically and it can also show up with our emotions and our, our mental health overall. So this is then kind of part of the, the core human givens organizing idea. I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about that, which is that our, our, our needs, what our needs actually are and, and the fact that we need to meet these needs in reasonable, healthy balance. And that varies from person to person in order to be able to flourish and to grow uh, and to be mentally healthy. And that mental illness then comes from those needs being blocked in some way. And we'll look at how that happens as well. So I'll come back to how this relates to other therapies in a moment, but if we can just move on, Joe, if we can just have a look at, at what we mean by those needs. Now, there are two sets of needs we might think about. There are physical needs. So we, have, we obviously, as human beings, we have a need for food, for water, for hydration, for sunlight, for exercise, for shelter from the elements. Um, and we can see that when those physical needs aren't met, mental health does suffer. When people are in poverty, when they are unable to feed themselves, when they're unable to access a healthy diet or a, a appropriate warmth, all of those kinds of things, that that then impacts on people's physical and mental health. But even when all of those needs are met, we can also see that people can still experience problems with their mental health. And that's because we also have a set of emotional needs. Now, I'm not going to go through these in absolute detail today, but you, you can see that these are the ones that are kind of drawn from the research base. And when these emotional needs are, are, are met, we can be healthy. And when they are um, not met, then that can cause problems. And what you will also see from looking at these needs is that actually some of them are in competition with each other. So our need for attention and to be connected to other people is also in kind of conflict with our need for privacy and, and a chance to have space to ourselves. So what we're looking for across our needs is, is a balance. 
Um, and again, as I said earlier, that need that, that balance will differ depending on the individual, on their cultural background, on the circumstances around them. The point of life that you're in, the balance that we might seek out when we're teenagers might be different when we get to sort of my age. Um, so we're looking for a balance that works in the individual's life in that moment. And what you can also see from those needs is we're not also just thinking about the individual because we are not um, isolated creatures. We are a herd animal. We need other people around us. And you'll see that many of our emotional needs are also about our connection to other people. We need that connection to, to community. We need emotional intimacy and we need attention from other people in order for us to be able to thrive overall. So that seems fairly straightforward. We have these needs and, and you're, what we were seeing in psychology, more and more people now started to talk about the importance of needs being met. And you'll see different lists in the research. Um, that's largely you'll actually the, very similar things, but just phrased differently is, is what you'll generally see. So what then happens to prevent people from meeting these needs? And basically what this comes down to is there are three main reasons why this this uh, happens there are three kind of barriers to us being able to meet our needs overall and this is a really important part of our organizing idea because all of those things i spoke to you about at the beginning if you think about it under the these three things this basically covers everything that comes up in the research everything that can kind of indicate that, that there's an indication that it might have a negative potential impact on someone's mental health it's covered under these three points so the first is that there's a problem in the environment and that might be the local environment so somebody might be in a relationship which is toxic or they might be in a work environment which is toxic to them in which they're being bullied or it can be a general societal thing if people are experiencing discrimination in wider society that obviously can have an impact on people's ability to meet their needs and then as a result of that um they don't get the nourishment that they need and therefore can can develop problems with their mental health the second thing is a kind of disruption to the eternal guidance system so we have a as human beings, we're, we have evolved to get our needs met. And if you think about the fact that, you know, babies come out of the womb ready to suckle, ready to, you know, um, bond with their caregivers and things like that, we have skills built into us right from the very beginning. We have resources built into us that allow us to get our needs met. But something happens to disrupt that. So there might be some, something genetic that disrupts that. It might be something that happens in terms of an accident. You know, people might experience brain injuries, which then makes it more difficult for them to get their needs met. And the things we're most likely to see in the therapy room, there might be something like um, faulty conditioning. So someone has learned some thinking or some behavior in response to their environment that's actually now problematic and gets in the way of their meeting their needs. Or people might, be, might have experienced a trauma in their life and we know that trauma can be disruptive. And then the final thing is people just might not have developed the skill. We see many of the people that, that Joe and I work, we work with students a lot. And quite often, one of the things we're seeing now is young people not able to go into a room where there are lots of people that they don't know and start a conversation and introduce themselves because they don't have the skill set to do it. It's never been developed. So actually missing skills might mean that people don't know how to use the resources that they have available to them to get those needs met. But if you look at all of the kind of things in research that are indicated that have a negative impact on mental health, it's captured under these kind of three barriers. So, okay, so there might be barriers, but actually lots of the time people are mentally healthy and they're able to meet their needs. So, so how are they able to do that? Well, that's because we've got resources. We're born with a set of resources and we're able to build life resources to help us get those needs met. So these are the things on the screen that you can see now are things that we were born with, the ability to, to create memory and to use our imagination. You know, these are extraordinary things. You think about the fact that we can use that memory to, so when we've learned something, we can hold on to it and use it to get our needs met in a different situation later in our lives. We've got a rational mind, we have emotions, we can build relationships with others. And very importantly in the human givens framework, we, we dream and that dreaming allows us to kind of discharge emotional arousal that's built up over the course of the day so that we can start fresh the next day, free from, from any of that emotion. And during our life, then we're also able to build up other resources. So we're able to, to, you know, our relationships, the hobbies we have, the interests, our work, all of those things can also become resources that help us to get our needs met overall. So that then in a nutshell is the core kind of organizing idea that we have in human givens. But human beings have needs. When those needs are met in balance, we're mentally healthy. When they're not, we go into distress. We've got resources that we can use to help us get those needs met. But there are barriers that sometimes prevent that. And therefore our work as a therapist is simply to help identify what those barriers are, to help people overcome them using their own resources wherever possible, so that they're then able to meet their own needs in their own life using their own resources, and that they'll no, no longer need therapy. They're able to just live a healthy, flourishing life. And so that's our kind of aim within human givens therapy. 
And our approach to being able to do that is really drawn on the work that um, Ivan Terrell and Joe Griffin did when they looked at all of the different therapies out there, of which there are, are, are many, and they really took a look at what worked and, and what didn't work and really drilled down to find out why certain things worked and certain things didn't. So we draw on lots of other um, modalities of, of therapy and counselling, um, as well as psychology and of, of neuroscience as well. Um, and putting all of those things together held within that organising idea um, is, is the human givens approach really underneath that, that human givens umbrella. Yeah. And then of course, what we're, what, what we're able to then add into the dis is there are some specific things that we've then developed through human givens. So that we then looked at, at, at finding things that could work as quickly as possible. So we have a number of techniques that um, were built on from, from other modalities and a number of things that we've kind of developed ourselves new insights to kind of pull all of this together in a really pragmatic practical framework so that as a therapist once you're trained you're able to sit down and work with a broad range of clients because what we're very much trying to do is we're not as therapists trying to sell the idea of human givens to our clients we work through their experience we're looking at what their resources are what their barriers are and helping them find solutions in their own life using all of those skills drawn from all of the evidence, all of the research, all of the, the other work that's been done to help the individual then use the resources around them so that they're able to get their own needs met. And we're a very positive solution focused therapy. We're a brief therapy. Um, we do try and work as quickly as is possible for each individual and that varies enormously. So that's not necessarily saying we're gonna you know, work through with every individual that comes into therapy in, in three, four, five, six sessions. Some people do need much longer but as quickly as possible so that people are able to meet their needs in their own life and aren't relying on therapy to help them to do that as much as possible. Mm. And I think the beauty of, of the way that it's structured means that it's constantly evolving and we're able to draw on new findings and new learnings all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we keep updating our ideas. We keep updating um, the, the basis of what we're doing and we're constantly looking at the new ideas that are coming up, the evidence behind them, um and, and revising and updating um the model as well and you know the great thing is since since the, the model was created um you know that that f f founding organizing idea is proving more and more solid it's giving more and more answers as the evidence emerges but there are things that come along you know sometimes occasionally a new technique emerges that's more effective than the ones we've been using and because we have this flexible organizing idea we're able to absorb that and adapt it into the model to make it what we do as up to date as possible mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll perhaps then just pause there at that point and, and just see if there are any questions specifically about the organizing idea, the human givens model, how we fit into that, about the world of therapy or mental health overall. Um, and then we'll come on and talk about the diploma after that. So do we have any specific questions popping up about, about all of that, Jane? A lot of them about the diploma itself. There, there was one that came through earlier, which was asking exactly that actually about um where the human givens approach fits in the broader landscape of therapy psychotherapy and counseling and why would you specifically recommend this approach uh, over and above anything else basically yeah i mean i think it's important that you find when you're working as a therapist that you find the model that makes sense to you and that works for you so that's you know that's really important but i think from my perspective the reason i was always drawn to human givens therapy was first of all the fact that it 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 was up to date that it was constantly updating and that it was drawn on the evidence. And as a researcher, that's quite an important thing for me. Um, but also just the fact that as soon as I started doing the training and started going back into Hall's residence where I was and started trying it out, it worked and it worked quite quickly and it, and, it, and effectively. And, and with people who had maybe been trying other things that, that and hadn't found solutions, hadn't found things that worked for them. And so from my own experience, it was just the fact that I could go and I could work quickly with people. And it, it really empowered the, the, the clients that I was working with, you know, it gave them back the feeling that they could take control of things in their own life, that they could find the solutions to this. And then, you know, seeing people um, transform, seeing people recover, because, largely because of what they were doing, you know, was, was an extraordinary thing to be able to kind of sit and be part of and to, to sit alongside them while they were doing that. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think, you know, it, it, it seems to work. Certainly the evidence that we have indicates that it works. The research that we've done indicates that it works. It works quickly and it empowers people to be able to go and live a healthy life themselves. Um, and I've seen that certainly within my own practice as well. And I think that was the thing that really encouraged me. I think the practicality of it is really useful. The fact that it works really practically um, 
Yeah, I don't know about you, Joe, if you say something different. Yeah, the, no, no, the, the the same, really. I just, um, from that, that very first um, workshop that I, I came and did, I just thought, actually, this there is so much here to add into my my toolkit to make me a more effective therapist. Um, and I did find that, um, you know, obviously I just did more and more of the, the workshops and, and added more tools and became um, increasingly effective and, and felt increasingly more um, secure, I think, in what I was doing because I was seeing the results um, and getting the feedback um, quite rapidly in a very different way. Mm. Mm. And certainly here in the office, we, we hear from, from clients and from practitioners themselves, and they're, they're saying exactly that. And we've had some people who've had human given therapists who've been so convinced that it's transformed what they've been doing that they've then come back and trained with us, which is a rather nice because they then want to go yeah. and do the same for other people, which is Indeed, rather nice. We see that on the diploma that there are people who who come in and yeah. say, Oh, you know, however many you know years ago I had I had therapy with an HD therapist and it changed my life, and I, you know, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. 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 Actually, well, while we've been talking there, I've got questions come through saying, will you will you please elaborate on what you mean by practicality without obviously putting other means down, but in more concrete terms, if possible? What you yeah, mean. absolutely. So one of the things that we because we're working with the resources that the person has available. So you think about those innate resources we talked about earlier, but also in terms of the resources the person has in their life. We're looking at changing things in their life practically. So it's not just about someone exploring and there's value in that. There's value in exploring things. You say, I don't want to put other therapies down because, you know, there's value in, in some of that work too. But, you know, exploring has some value, but actually we're also looking at, okay, but what needs to change in your life in order for you to get your needs met? So we look for where there are practical solutions and where we can add that in. And very often what you'll find is it's a matrix of things. So there are some practical solutions. There's some things with thinking or past. There might be some work with trauma that we need to do. But the mix of all of that together makes it more effective so that, we're not just doing the work with the person's thinking or the person's emotions. We're also looking at well, what's happening on a day to day basis. What, what are the things that might be keeping you stuck in the feeling that you're getting? Are there things around you that you could be doing or things you used to do that really were helpful to your well-being overall? And can we reconnect you with that? So we're working with the, the practicalities of the person's life. And, and that also includes the practical difficulties. So we're not also not we're not avoiding that, you know, if someone comes along and there are a lot of genuine practical difficulties, we're not ignoring that either. So it's about the practical details of the person's life that we ground our therapy in. Um, I think that that's key thing for me, I think. Joe, I don't know if you've got. Yeah, and absolutely. You know, you, you'll never do um, a, the same session twice. So you're absolutely working with the individual that comes into the room. Um, the resources that they bring and also looking for any skills that you might need to teach somebody anything where they've, they've got gaps um, that that can be taught um, whilst understanding the context of their life and working with you know with with achievable and and, and realistic goals for them so that they they very quickly get that sense of of positive change mm-hmm. yeah absolutely absolutely no I mean it is very holistic but what I think I know you also look at the, the physical side of things, people's sleep patterns, all that kind of it's very much yeah. so. the, the, yeah. the whole picture, really. Absolutely. Um, yeah. We've got another question here that comes up a lot. Um, so I might as well get it out there, which is why is human givers not BACP accredited? Are there plans for it to be in the future? Which is perhaps one to unpack a little bit because that is yeah. up a lot. Yeah. Okay, so let's just disentangle this a little bit. So um and I would just say um there's no fault in BACP's part of what I'm about to say, to, to say here, which is that BACP are not the regulating body for counsellors and psychotherapists in the UK. And there is a misperception that's the case. And actually BACP tried to dispel that myth as well. Um, there is There are a number of, of accrediting bodies of counsellors and psychotherapists in the UK. So you've got the Human Givens Institute, but you've also got BACP, UKCP, you know, the, uh, BPS. There's a number of others. They are all regulated by the Professional Standards Agency, the PSA. And, and the Human Givens Institute is regulated by the professional standards. So we are registered and accredited by the PSA in exactly the same way that BSCP is. So we are a similar accrediting body in exactly the same way. Um, and actually, as, as accrediting bodies, we work together. We've been working together on the, the scoped framework. So, you know, we have the, the, the same kind of status. Um, so the reason we're not part of BSCP is because we're, we're just another accrediting body. Um, and in the same way that, you know, if you think about other accrediting bodies in other parts of the medical profession, you know, occupational therapists are registered differently from um, 
midwives and nurses, but again, both their registering bodies are accredited by the PSA. So it, it's exactly the same framework. I hope that makes that clear. I, I, I hope so. Um, I just wonder whether there's any more particularly on this. I've got a lot of questions coming through about the diploma, but probably I think some of them are going to be answered by your next session where you're actually talking in more depth. So, yeah. so we crack on with the next bit and um, everyone bears with us. And hopefully a lot of these questions that are coming up will be answered in the next bit. OK. OK. So let's then pick up and talk about the diploma overall. So we'll come to the structure and the way that works in a moment. And we'll come to all of the kind of questions that, that, are, that are coming through as well. But let's just start talking about, first of all, the way that we teach, because the way we teach is also evidence led. And that's a really important part of, 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 of this as well. You know, we, our teaching is as informed by evidence as the therapy is. So we use teaching and learning approaches and assessment approaches that are consistent with the best evidence on, on what makes effective learning. Um, and assessments that actually strengthen your learning as well. So our focus all the way through is what's going to help you learn, what's going to help you develop the skills, the knowledge and the understanding that you need to go on to become a competent, safe, effective therapist at the end of training. Um, so we use um, a, a kind of, I mean, it depends how interested people are in this, but we use a range of kind of teaching techniques. We use a lot of practical work in the classroom. Um, so there are lots of kind of practice opportunities, particularly when you come to part two and part three, there are lots of opportunities to practice the skills. So we do, um, we will we'll kind of, we'll, we'll talk you through the skill set. We will show you how it works. We'll give you examples of it working, and then we'll get you practicing it so that you're starting to put that into a, a practice. And then we get you to come back and talk about your experience of that practice and what worked and what didn't work and what made sense to you and what didn't so that we can then build on that. We build, we, we, we structure our curriculum very carefully so that we keep coming back over and over the key points because all the acquisition of all knowledge requires pre-knowledge. So when you're coming in, if you've never done this before, don't worry if you forget stuff, don't worry if some stuff doesn't make sense straight away because the bits that do make sense will then stick in your memory and start to build. And then when we talk to you about it again and teach it again, it'll start to stick and start to build and start to grow because learning always works in levels. And so we're very conscious that the, the diploma is structured to work in building that level of knowledge and understanding as you go along. So it grows and grows and grows and you become more and more expert in, in what you're understanding. And we work very hard to create a classroom that is going to support that learning. That's going to be safe. That's going to feel that you can explore it, where you can make mistakes, where you can ask, ask questions, where you can get things wrong. All of that is absolutely fine because we know that that's a key part of learning. And, and we're really keen on people just being able to say, I just don't get this. I don't understand it. You're not making sense. Um, or, I, or I disagree with it so we can have that conversation and that debate because again that benefits the learning of everybody in the classroom overall. Absolutely and I think that you know the, the way it's structured as well really um, is is allows such a flexibility for the learning process as well because obviously you know when when I came into the training I'd got two very small children and then had a third one um, part way through my training so it was really you know I could dip into um, the individual um, workshops initially um, just to, to suit me really and around my own my own practice my own career at the time um, and and again the way the way it moves through is that there's you know we, we don't just run it once a year there are different times that you can come in to all of the different levels so there really is that 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 huge flexibility within the, the structure of the training um, mm -hmm. around people's lives yeah. and we, we we try to make that uh, everything that we're doing as inclusive as possible so the way that we teach we're, we're trying to make we try to make that as accessible and inclusive as possible and no one or two people have been asking the questions beforehand about concerns about having not been in the classroom or not sat an exam or one or two of you i think who who um have dyslexia we make this as, as accessible and as inclusive as possible being a therapist doesn't require you to be good at writing things down so that's not a thing that we're going to be testing um, there is an exam. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But again, on the exam, we're not testing spelling and grammar. We're, we're interested in the knowledge that you have. So none of those things are barriers. And we do support uh, students with specific learning differences as, as they're coming through. And we also know that there are challenges. Things crop up in life. There are things that may interrupt what's happening as you're going along. And that's absolutely fine. We can support you with that. We can flex. We can work with you to make sure that you're able to transition through all of that. So we're really keen to work with you to give you the best experience that you possibly can. And we can work with you whether you're a complete novice or whether you've been a qualified practitioner in another modality or another field. We get a lot of um, 
people who are already qualified as mental health nurses or OTs or social workers or, or actually GPs. We, we have a running joke at the moment that we also have a, we always have a GP chair on our part two because the last number of part twos, we've had a GP in training with us. Um, and whatever your background, wherever you're coming from, it, it's designed to be as flexible as possible to, to, to take you in and, and carry you through all of that. And we'll very much work with you to get you where you need to be, however you know experienced or not that you are. Absolutely. And because everybody is coming in at, with, you know, different life experiences, different training experiences, um, different career pathways, um, you know, we, we do take all of that into account. And all of the tutors um, on the diploma are experts, not only in their field, but also have extensive teaching experience, um, both, I mean, for Gareth and I within higher education, um, within secondary schools, um, and also within, you know, professional development training courses as well. So there's a, a, a huge amount of resource and, and expertise um, at, at the end of, of that and you know we all, we will always encourage you to ask questions um, and one of the things you know we trot out time and time again is there are no silly silly questions we might give you a silly answer and if we don't know what the answer is we'll go away and find out for you but um, you know just to to never think I can't ask something because you know other people are more experienced than me because actually what we find it helps us with our teaching because it helps us to identify where where some gaps might be because you know at the end of the day we want you to do really well um you know it, it's not in our interest we're not trying to catch you out or anything so um you know we, it's very much a collaborative um process of learning. yeah absolutely yeah and i can for those of you who haven't tried anything you know one of the benefits of the way that we've set the course up again also is that you can try out one or two of the days and um, we can try out one or two of the online to see what you think, to see if you like it, to see if it chimes with you before you have to commit to a whole course. And that again, that's deliberately done so that, you know, you're not having to make a commitment right from the off to say, well, I'm going to do the whole diploma. Come and try one or two days. That's certainly what I did. I, I only intended to go on one or two of the days that seemed to make most sense to the work I was doing at the time and then liked it and enjoyed it and got more interested and then did a few more and then did a few more and then gradually thought, oh, actually, I'd like to do the diploma. Yeah. So, you know, feel free to do it in that way. Um, it, it probably makes sense if you're going to attend one of the in-person days, if you can start with the language day, it's a really good kind of overall that it's two days, actually the language days. Mm -hmm. It's a really good two days. It kind of gives you an encapsulation, gives you the, the, the kind of foundation stones of, of human givens practice and a really good insight into the way that, that human givens therapy works. And then from there, you can have a think about, well, actually, is it, is it worth me doing more and do I want to continue with all of this? Absolutely. And also, you know, it's one of those ones that, you, and, you know, as, as most of them are really ones that you can take off and they're applicable in, in any of the, the, you know, the, the avenues that you're, you're currently in as well. So you can do the language days and really pick up so much that you can take off into, mm. into your current workplace. Um, and we do actually have an offer um, on the language days as well um, that you'll 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 be entitled to. You see on the the last slide. Um, so if you were thinking about um, you know dipping your toe in the water, um, you know that that's a really good place to start. The other thing is probably worth saying is that although this is a it's a diploma for training therapists, that actually you can do part of it, and and we have a number of our students who who do parts of the course and then go off and do other things. So, um, you know, we've had people do this and then go off, you know, they, they completed the part two and then take it off and started working in business to, to kind of run training programs on mental health and in, in the workplace or um, people who've taken it off into kind of pastoral roles or work within schools or so on. So it, although it, the, the full diploma is there for you if you want to become a human given therapist, actually you can do parts of it for whatever kind of work you want to do. You don't necessarily have to do the whole thing for it to be useful for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So should we have a look at the, the structure? OK, so just briefly, the overview, the, we have what we call part one. Um, and on part one, it's a mixture of online courses and in-person workshops. And you'll also be given um, a reading list when you, when you sign up um, to that. And within the, the workshops, there'll be skills practices, as Gareth was saying earlier. Um, and then moving on to part two, um, which is two weeks um, that are set in one week blocks about a, a month or so apart. Um, and at the end of that, um, there is a, a, a written exam. 
um, but we'll go into more detail on that um, shortly. Um, but also what we're looking for is an ongoing um, assessment of your, of your practice, really. And then once you finish your part two, you can join um, the Human Givens Institute, which is that um, accrediting body that uh, Gareth talked about that uh, sits um, under the PSA um, alongside uh, the other bodies as well. Um, and then if you choose to go on to do the practitioner um, level, you'll be um, signing up with a supervisor and looking for some um, for some clients. And then the part three is, um, again, a week uh, block of um, uh, wonderfully um, energizing and intensive um, therapeutic practice and ongoing assessment. Um, and, you know, it, I mean, I'm smiling because we just love teaching this same way, don't we? You know, all, yeah. all of it. Um, it's just an absolute joy. It really is. Um, and then you will then be a, a fully qualified um, human givens therapist psychotherapist counselor practitioner whatever you choose to call yourself and you'll be entered on to the uh, to the professional register so if we break that down a little bit further for you we can have a look at that in a little bit more detail um so we do need on the part one you will need to have completed all of the courses before um you attend um the part two um, the in-person workshops are run in various locations and we do those in London and Bristol and in Leeds currently. Um, and obviously the online courses can be done in your own time. And at the end of each course, there's, there's some um, questions that you will need to complete before you move on. You'll also be given the reading list, as I was saying. Um, and but if anybody was thinking that they might like to to start to dip into some of the things on the reading list, a really good place to start is actually the Human Givens books. So um, the the Human Givens books itself, but also there are some shorter books on anxiety, depression, anger, and and they they are really really useful. Um, they're they're written in such an accessible um, accessible font, um, but also a really accessible language and 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 really useful and and easy for people to pick up we also have um a human givens podcast um and and we we include that in in our reading list for our diploma students and and because each time we, we each um episode of the podcast we talk to somebody um who's a, a, an expert in their field or who's had certain experiences um in certain areas of, of human givens um and the learning um i mean i host the podcast the learning that i get from 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 the people that I, I i speak to is is incredible and i know that our students really really value um the content of those as well um, so all of those things will be um, will be happening before you move on to your part two. Part two, as Joe said, is is probably um, my favourite thing to do in in my work at full stop at all. I love teaching the part two. Uh, so the part two is two separate weeks, and they're normally a few weeks apart. So they're normally kind of five or six weeks apart, and that's for us to let the learning from the first week consolidate, and then we pick it up and work with it again in the second week. And we, part, part two kind of picks up some of the stuff that you've learned in part one, and then we add to it and deepen it and work with your knowledge so that you really start to connect everything together and see how everything uh, actually comes together as one and as one approach and as one way of doing therapy. Um, and the first week is very much focused on the kind of the structure of therapy and the techniques and the skills of therapy. And then the second week looks pr pretty much at um, the kind of presentations that are going to come into your room, the common things that you're going to see is working with things like people who are experiencing depression, anxiety, um, trauma, uh, addiction, anger, those kinds of things, and also looking at ethics and, and kind of um, thinking about the diversity of our practice and how we need to work with all of that. Um, at the end of that that uh, part two, there is a two-hour written exam. Please don't worry about that if you've not done an exam for years. Most of our students, that's the, that's the case. For most of our students, would probably be classified as mature students. They're they're not people who are 21, 22 and have just come out of university. Um, they've got people with the, they're people with a bit more life experience. Many of whom haven't written an exam for years. That was certainly the case for for me and for Joe as well. Yeah, we will get you there. We will get you ready. If you work with us and, and do the learning that we did with us and engage with us and read your manual um, and engage with the practice that we do in the classroom, you'll be ready for the exam. You really will. Um, and as I say, we're not asking you to write, it's not essays, it's a knowledge based exam. There are, there are questions that are asking for short answers and bullet point answers. And even some of them you can do with written with diagrams, you can answer them in that kind of way. As long as we can see that you know what we, you've been taught and you've got the information and knowledge in your head. 
then that's all we're looking for. And the reason we do it as an exam is because as a therapist, there are certain things you just need to know. You cannot be sitting with a client and thinking, oh, I just need to look that up. I've definitely read something about it somewhere. You just need to know it. And so an exam is a good way of testing that you can, first of all, that you've got the knowledge and that you can recall it under pressure. So that's why we use an exam at that point. It's the only written assessment that we do. And as I said, we're not looking at the quality of your writing. We're looking at whether or not you know what you've been taught and what you need to know in order to be a therapist. Absolutely. We're just we're looking for your understanding, really, that yeah. you've understood um, what we've taught you. So um, you can be as creative as you want in the way that you explain your understanding. Yeah. And then from that, then you can from part two, then you're you're able to um, go on to the register as a trainee at that point. And you can start working then with um, members of the public um, to, to start building your skills. Yeah, so between part two and part three, if you choose to, to go on to the practitioner level, um, you'll be signing up to uh, with a, a supervisor and you'll be working really closely with a, a supervisor who's a supervisor tutor. Um, and, and so their, their role is to help to develop um, what you've what you've learned and what you've understood on your part two. Um, and you'll be working with them um, on a one to one basis. And at the moment, we, we, we set that supervision at um, one hour of supervision for every eight hours of um, practice that you have had um, as a trainee in therapy. So the kind of clients that we'll be um, helping you to, you know, to work with, you'll be looking at working with mild to moderate anxiety and depression and um and, and phobias um and also when you're ready looking at working with um you know perhaps a, a, a single incident um trauma as well so those things that you you be bringing into supervision is discussion around the the casework that you're doing your supervisor will have had a very um a, a, a nice little report from the the work that you did on on part two and so they'll know the kind of things that um you will be wanting to develop yourself to help you to to hone that therapeutic um skill and and, and practice and understanding um so alongside looking at the the casework that you're doing they'll perhaps be doing some role play with you um perhaps be looking at refining some of the skills um that, that you've been taught and really looking at your language um, and your deep understanding of, of, of the core concepts. So we quite often get asked, you know, how long is it between part two and part three? Um, and um, a, a funny phrase that comes up time and time again is it depends. Um, and we now have students who are timing us on how long it takes us to say it depends. And we had one cohort of students who actually all had T-shirts printed with it depends on. Um, I still maintain we don't say it too often because it really does depend. So every bit it depends on every individual. It depends on um, what what you've come into um, the, the learning with and and what's going on in your own lives as well, really. So um, we, we do say, you know, uh, between part two and part three, we, we advise that you do that within two years. Um, but circumstances alter cases. And if there's an extenuating circumstance, then we can certainly discuss that, that with you. Um, we're looking really for when you're ready to, to take it. So it's not going through a certain amount of clients necessarily or um, having a certain amount of, of sessions. It's about the individual and it's you'll you'll come to that agreement with your supervisor tutor as to when the time is right for you. And they can assess that through looking at um, you, your submission of some recordings of sessions. So you'll be able to um, have a, a consent form and, and agree that uh, recording with your client um, and submit those recordings to your supervisor tutor who'll be able to assess your readiness um, from from that and from the work that they're doing with you one to one uh, as to when you're ready for part three. Yeah and then so we 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 move when you are ready then you can come to part three. Part three is is a, a, another um, kind of single block week um, and again it's a learning week we've designed it principally as a week where again you're going to build on all that um, skill that you've built all that knowledge and understanding that you've gathered from working with clients and we build on that and we, we seek to extend and deepen your knowledge overall key part of that as well though is that it is also the final assessment so and one of the things we do in human givens therapy is the way we assess your ability to do therapy is we watch you doing some therapy and we give you some feedback on it 
um, and we but we are assessing you through against kind of key um, assessment criteria. Uh, we'll also ask you to do a, a viva. Don't worry too much about the details of all of this. But the viva is basically is a is like a vocal exam. You'll be asked to come up with ways in which the human givens ideas could be applied in the world outside of therapy. So you know in the workplace or in schools or something. Um, and then the tutors will have a conversation with you about your idea. And what we're really testing is that you've really understood the organizing idea and, and its application to the wider public. And at the end of all of that, then you'll be asked to do a reflective personal development plan. And that will be to reflect on where your strengths are, where there's still areas for development, how you feel the part three week went for you. And as a result, where then you you think you need to develop over the course of the next year and what your plan is going to be to continue your development, because a really important part of being a, a therapist or actually any um, health professional is you've got to continue to develop. You've got to continue that work and continue to, to stay updated and to build on your strengths and to build your ability over time as you become more and more successful. And then when you're fully qualified, you will be able to join the, the professional register. Um, as we said earlier on that, that's, that's accredited in the UK by the PSA. Um, and um, that then allows you to, to work with members of the public and, and to apply for work elsewhere. And we know we've got other questions coming through that we will pick up about all of that. Um, but that then is basically how that the, the structure of the diploma journey takes you from potentially novice through to um, competent, uh, qualified therapist who will be able to, to, to work with people who are experiencing problems and, and help them get their needs met in balance. And that whole journey is, you know, it, I've talked already about the, the tutors and the supportive environment that the, the tutors are creating, but you've got the whole of the HG community as well, which in itself is a is an incredibly supportive community. And within that, there are peer groups that you can join as well. So it won't just be that you're, you know, you're having your your one to one supervision with your supervisor tutor, you can sign up to be part of uh, a peer group um, and, and go along and be supported uh, within that environment as well. And a lot of those, um, we used to have designated online ones, but now um, the world has turned. Um, so many of those uh, run online as well as in person as well. So there's a lot of flexibility. And you don't have to necessarily um, be in the, you know, in, in the area that the peer group runs because you can do it online. And the same with a supervisor. You don't need to worry that you need to, to pick a supervisor that's close to you because a lot of that supervision is available online as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So shall we just pause there because I'm aware there yeah. are a lot of comp questions coming through. Um, and, and I'd like to make sure we pick up as many of those as possible so that people feel that they've, they've had a chance to get their questions answered. Um, so I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm picking my way through. I don't know, Ar um, Jane or Arlene, but- oh, Sorry, I'm just typing an answer to somebody. That's okay. <laughs> that was okay. I was mid reply. Um, so as, like you say, there's a lot of questions coming through here, but there's a couple of real strong themes coming through. So I don't know if we can get some of those first. Mm -hmm. okay. um, one of them is is for people, um, as you know, we get quite a bit of interest from people overseas. So, um, and, and other people in the UK have for various reasons find it hard to travel. And they're keen to know, um, you know, how much is done online, whether the workshops can be done online and I know we're we're very keen we do as much as we can online but most of uh, a lot of the diploma is in, is in person so mm -hmm. it would be great if you could just answer answer the reasons for that and yeah. another question which kind of ties into that also is the fast tracking and groups the way we block our courses so that people can hopefully travel to do segments of courses yeah, of course, absolutely. So I think it is important. So we, we, we do try and put as, as much online as possible and we will continue to do that and look at ways in which we can do that because we are aware of, of, of that challenge. The thing is, though, that whenever you're training to do any course like this, it is really important that you are able to do some in-person training. And if you think about all, you know, any other health professional, you know, like nurses or, or OTs or anything like that, it, it needs, some of it needs to be in person because we need to do face-to-face -face practice. Um, and also for us as tutors, we need to be able to see what your understanding and what your knowledge base is like and how it's growing. And that is much more possible to do in the classroom than it is online. But principally, it's about the fact that actually for, for, to develop those practical skills, um, it's necessary to do some of that in person. So that's why the, particularly the part twos and the part threes um, are, 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 are completely in person because we need to do that in that way. And, and some of the part one is so that we are able to, again, develop those in-person skills. Doing therapy online is actually quite challenging and you, you kind of need to have the skills of doing therapy in place first before you then actually then try and do the added level of doing therapy online. So we need to train you as a therapist, working person to person, 
and and then there are there are additional courses we can we can offer to you for you to then de develop your skill to work online as well but the actual a big chunk of the training we prefer yeah. to be in, in the room part of that absolutely assessment. in terms of how we chunk together you'll see if you look at part one we try and put them together in three day blocks so that you can come and do three days in a row um and we normally try and book weeks four together as well sometimes, actually. Yeah. yeah four That's even as well cool. yeah. we did used to do fast tracks where we were doing five days in a row the, the, what we found was and the feedback we had from students was by the, by day five it was impossible to take anything else in mm -hmm. it was just too much um and we were then finding that when we got to part two the learning that had been done in those fifth days people just weren't holding on so it. it was just it was it was not their fault at all there was yeah. just a point at which you know you, your your ability to hold on to new information is just overwhelmed so we we've stopped in the fast track because it's because it's not great for learning um but we do try and chunk things together as much as we can in in time frames that actually do still work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no that's absolutely right i mean um one of the other things actually that comes from people interested in doing it online are uh, is the um how the diploma whether it's uh, accredited whether it's um, recognized overseas um and i don't know if you can talk a little bit about the complexity of that I don't know if you want to take that, Joe, or if you want me to. Yeah. We have a number of um, people that come through that work, work overseas. I know that we've got people um, in, in the States. We've got people in Australia, New Zealand. Um, I think I've got uh, supervisees in Greece at the moment. Um, and I think it really depends on on where you're where you're living, and uh, certainly even within the in the United States of America, it varies between the states. Um, and I think some of it comes down to what you call yourself. So sometimes the the you know they they might be a protected title, so you might not be able to call yourself a psychotherapist or a counsellor, but you can call yourself a practitioner, um, and you will be able to get um, in insurance and be covered that way. Yeah. It just depends where you live. You need to check out with with your own insurers, really, as to as to your your own locality. Yeah, the regulations move so much between, as I said, between states and even within countries and things like that. Yeah. It's very hard to do that. So it, it really is about checking your own area. But we do have, as we say, we've got people in in Ireland, the Netherlands. Um, so you know, have a look, and, yeah. and if you have a look on the HG um, registration, you you can have a look for whether there's anybody registered near to you. Um, and if you if you contact them and ask them about it, they'll 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 usually be quite happy to have a conversation with you and, and talk to you about their experience of that. I'm a bit delighted to have some more HG people in their region. I yes. would, <laughs> absolutely. We've got, we've got quite a few in Australia, haven't we? And yeah. we have. We've got France. Yeah. We've got Germany. Yeah. Spain, yeah. Lots lots all over. And we do find a lot of people, even though it, it might not be formally, um, you know. Um, accredited or what or recognized in, in overseas but people are doing it because it gives them the skills that they need and they once they've they've tried it they can they often might do it alongside you know their existing training that they've had and they use these to, to augment their skills yeah um and talking of augmenting these skills something that comes up a lot actually is um whether we do any accredited prior learning and um we don't tend to do this um so i don't again i don't know if you can speak to that a little bit yeah so the, the the reason for that is that we we again it's that the learning that you've got um it takes time for us to be able to work and build the, the understanding of the human givens approach overall and again necessarily you know so, some of that prior learning may be useful but actually we need to build from from ground up the the, the, the curriculum is very carefully st structured and scaffolded to allow you to do that building from part to part so if you were to come in from a different modality straight into part two i think you'd be lost um, it, it would be really difficult to jump and it wouldn't be fair to you to do that. Um, so we, we need to get you working through all the different parts so that you, you understand the part of the diploma that you're in. Uh, otherwise, I think it, it, you would be a bit lost and it wouldn't make a lot of sense. So that, and it wouldn't really, really be fair to any student to do that, I don't think. And even things like if you if the hypnotherapist or something like that, so you've got some of the guided imagery, what we call guided imagery skills, then we it's still a requirement actually to, yeah. to do it just to make sure that it, it's in tune with the way um yeah. that you teach it so you can go on and learn the rewind technique and and so forth um yeah. we've got a huge amount of questions here so um i don't know if there's any um I'll so go there's, on. there's there's a few that are just as i'm just as you're done i was just yeah. looking through there's a few here that we can probably do quite quickly and, and, and kind of work quite through quite quickly so i mean 
Um, there are some things about about the, the, the model itself, about whether it aligns with the trauma informed approach. And and yes, Luke, absolutely, it does. We've we've talked about trauma and the impact of trauma right from from human given's inception, uh, and we have a particular look at at trauma and a, and a technique called the rewind technique for working with trauma, and and things that you're seeing in the literature now where people are starting to talk about big T and little T trauma we've had that in our model right from the beginning so yeah absolutely it fits very much alongside a trauma-informed approach and and um i think someone else was asking about whether we look at cbt and dbt certainly cbt we've got quite a, we take some elements of cbt that we use but we use it within the human givens overarching framework and, and we build other things around it so it's it's not pure cbt cbt is if you were going to go to a qualification in that but certainly as part of the human givens model we're using techniques and evidence um uh, informed approaches from CBT that are definitely part of what we do. Um, and then other, the, the other question I thought was probably quite quick, and there were a number of these, which was about working with autism and ADHD and whether that would work. I've, I've worked with lots of students with autism and ADHD, and absolutely it works very well because it's just, if you think about the organizing idea about helping people get their needs met using the resources that they have around them, um, it's the same for everyone. It's just going to be different for different people. And so we just shape it to the individual who's with us. And, and you know, there's a great saying in the autism community that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Um, and so, you know, even though someone's coming with that label, we, we are shaping the therapy around the individual, not their label. And, and absolutely, we can work with it. Sometimes that means the resource we have to look at might be some external resource, some additional support. Um, but, you know, um, absolutely, it, 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 it does work very well. Um, and I've certainly worked very well with, I mean, the students that I'm working with, so they're, they're at, you know, that very high functioning end um, of, of uh, experience, students with autism, but absolutely I've seen it work extremely well. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure how many there, I think there was another one that I think one or two people were talking about that is probably worth us just picking up, which was, um, do, 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 where was Maria's question? about the the interaction between kind of the our, our our accrediting so just to explain the way this works so there's there are two separate entities there's the human givens college and we deliver the training and then there's the institute and the institute has um independents who sit on the board and the institute is overseen by the professional standards agency in terms of the college in terms of additional uh, external accreditation we are also possible part of the scoped framework which some of you may be aware of and that's a new national framework to cover all um, counseling and psychotherapy training in the UK. And what that's doing is it's setting standards that whatever validated, reasonable, you know, approach to therapy, whatever that training is, that it has to meet those standards. And we've been part of shaping those standards and our training will meet those standards and we'll be part of that framework overall. So that's an additional external accreditation to that. So we have the PSA in terms of registering our overall um, our institute, which is where you would be registered as a therapist, and then our training will be part of that kind of scoped framework overall. We have also in the past been accredited by a university, and um, we're, we're in kind of in between at the moment because we've been we've just reviewed our curriculum, and now that it's been reviewed and done, we're going to going to go back for for additional accreditation from a university so that we have that again another independent external accreditation. Because you're right, that is really important that we have that in place. Um, but that's the way that 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 works. Um, the college at the moment that. is going through um, CPD standards um, uh, accreditation process as well at the moment for all of its training. So that's something that's happening in the background um, on there. So I had actually answered that question, but you've done it a better job. Right. <laughs> okay. but it, but it, we've had a couple more people sort of coming back about the BACP thing, about the, the fact that that um, very much is something that people come up with if they're trying to get employment. Um, but that, again, is part of this whole sea change, really, where the, the PSA are working very, very hard to raise awareness and it, they're doing a, a great job. More and more employers, and even the NHS now state, rather than saying a BAC, they recommend a BACP accredited trainer, they say a PSA registered. So, so it, it is the change is coming. Yeah. Um, and might... that, that guidance actually went out through the NHS quite some years ago now, but it just takes a little while to, to filter down. So the guidance was that when recruiting, they should be asking for a PSA accredited, not a BACP, because um, it, it is discriminatory practice. Yeah. Um, there's somebody's asked about do we provide a supervisor? Yes, just to clarify, the supervisors are human given supervisor tutors. Um, so yes, they are our supervisors. Um, that, that you, you know, we won't tell you who your supervisor is. You can go and choose, but they are human given supervisors. Yeah. Yeah, and then somebody's asking, is there a cost for supervision? Noel is asking, um, uh, is there, as 
as a generally as a standard can yes no there is, there is a cost and the supervisors tend to the, the costs vary but they're sort of around 50 to 85 i think uh, mm. and that's what i understand so and that's working between the part two what we call working towards part three that's when you'd have a, a good chunk and you'd be working very very closely with your your supervisor um so that the cost there when we go on to talk about cost that's one that is actually a bit flexible it depends very much on how much help you might need how much practice you might need what your previous experience is so that's that is a variable in the costs and yeah. just to answer the other question people are having most supervisors work online so supervision yeah. absolutely is a thing that you can do online yeah yeah um we've got various um i had to think sorry there's i was trying to get them all into thing and uh, um, we've got one here about someone saying um my background is in movement and body-based approach to therapeutic work I'm oh, there's so many questions going through this move. Um, I'm familiar with the needs resources approach. And I'm a close friend who's worked with human given stuff. She says that college is becoming more specific in how people work under the HG label, um, mm. assuming because of wider regulatory bodies. Um, so their hesitation of taking a diploma is whether she could, uh, I'm saying, she, yes, she could still work with the modalities that they find effective, combining that with the needs and resources. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's probably as specific as it has ever been um, in terms of what we do. I don't think that's necessarily changed much um, other than that we've updated um, in line with new research and new evidence, really. So um, what we teach is, is generally in line with current research evidence and we teach things that we know work um, in terms of that. Um, and we we discourage people from mixing human givens with other things. And that, again, is something the PSA are very hot on is, is that people, your clients need to know what it is they're consenting to. So if they're coming for human given therapy, it's important they get human given therapy and not a different therapy that they haven't consented to because otherwise they're, they're receiving treatment they haven't consented to. So it's, it's just about us having that clarity. And I think that's the thing maybe you're picking up is, is um, us making sure that people are clear that when they are, that, that they know what they're coming for. And, and if you were if you were doing other kind of body based work, I mean, body based work is absolutely fine in therapeutic work. It, it can be a really effective way of doing it because, you know, helping people think about their breathing, their body stance, all of that kind of interceptive mm -hmm. feedback that you get can be a really effective way of working with all of that. So it wouldn't abs it wouldn't rule that out at all. Um, but we would want to be clear that, you know, what else you were you were mixing in with that and, and making sure that, again, that was evidence based and it fitted within the human givens approach and that people were getting what they were consenting to. Um, I hope that makes sense, but it's an ethical question, really, that, uh, in terms yeah. of what clients are coming for. Yeah, no, I can, absolutely. Can I Sorry, some, here, yeah, about some, somebody asking about, is it recognised in Ireland? We have a huge amount of um, AHG therapists in, in Ireland, um, uh, including Joe, Joe Griffin himself is indeed based in Ireland. So, yeah, we have, have a, a, a lot of people. Um, in Ireland and somebody's asked whether or not um, sessions are covered by private health insurance um, so w we are able to take people through private health insurance and um, your supervisor will be able to tell you how how to get um, approved by private health insurers yeah so that's partially going back to what you're saying in Ireland that's I know they've got more sort of they've got more concrete about who can call themselves yeah so forth so again as you as joe's saying there's there's a very successful dublin human given center and lots of therapists over there um so it would be a good idea to actually contact one of those perhaps have a chat to them if you were thinking about it they're usually very amenable to anyone interested in human givens and a lot of them um again they might have trained doing something else or whatever but they've done the human givens diploma because they found it very very effective um so, but they would be to, to find out the, the minutiae of what it's like what's um accepted in Ireland they would be the people to talk to yeah, absolutely um there's one here about other nine in-person workshops uh in one week um no we, we no. <laughs> no um the 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 work the in-person workshops are our full day um courses and we usually run three in a week sometimes four um uh, so that you can bunch them together but as gareth was saying with the, the fast track we just found that people on the fifth day were just saturated and, and the learning wasn't going and it wasn't effective learning you can do and what students do sometimes is they, they they because of the way we book the weeks you can do some weeks back to back um so that you can just do maybe one or two blocks where you would need to be um you know make, making those weeks available for, the, for those in-person workshops um if you can 
it probably makes sense to do them in, in, in maybe three blocks, just so that you can allow the learning to percolate and consolidate in your mind before then coming back to the next one. I certainly remember when I was doing the, 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 the training, you know, coming away from one day, I felt like, you know, my brain was expanding. So giving yourself the time and the space to allow that learning to consolidate and not to see the, the workshops as just things that to be done, but that actually it's a, it's a huge piece of learning that you need to engage with. So give your brain a break and let it absorb. I mean, I appreciate there are practical things and financial things people have got to work with, but as much as possible, give your brain whatever space you can afford mm -hmm. to allow it to absorb that learning so that you're able to then build on it and, and, and be secure in that knowledge when you then come into part two and part three. Absolutely. And practice the skills and so forth as well. Somebody's Absolutely. asking here, they said that they've got an HG supervisor already and can they keep her? It's so lovely that you want to keep her. <laughs> Whoever she is, I'm sure she'll be really happy. Um, if your particular supervisor is a supervisor tutor, then they can support you um, through your diploma journey. If they are not a supervisor tutor, and you'll just have to check that out um, with them, because I'm not sure who it is, um, uh, then then you would need to look for another supervisor tutor at, for, for the, this particular journey. Somebody's asking as well about working, well, a few people are about working with children and working with under 18s following part two. Um, if you are already working with children and that is your job um then you know you you will already have um you know an enhanced um uh disclosure and have the experience of working with children then um again it's one of those things circumstances or cases if you're not already working with children um then we would we would say say no yeah. because it, it is much more complex yeah the, the thing that we need to remember in that part is that you're a trainee at that part and we need to be protecting the public as well and, and making sure that you're working with things that are within your range of competence really and, and as I say working with a child is just that little bit more complex it brings that little bit more challenge so we would want you working with adults first but certainly in terms of the approach overall it works very well with yeah. children we've got people I've got supervisees who work in schools and again it's a very good approach and, and sometimes as well the framework that the organizing idea we talked about at the beginning particularly can work very well with, with young men and teenage boys because it gives them a framework through which they can talk about what's going on for them emotionally that they may otherwise struggle with. Um, so it, it works very well. And I've, I said most of my career has been working in universities and working with you know young men 18 to 21, and that's worked very well. But I do we, we do have colleagues working in schools and working exclusively with children and who find that it works really well as, as an approach overall. Um, we, we, do have a, we do have a question about whether there's a, there's a high non-completion rate. Um, because of the way we work, people generally, in most cases, get to the stage of the diploma they want to get to. So some people step off a of part one, some people step off a of part two because they've got what they need. Obviously, not everyone can get there, but we work very hard to do that. And because we recognize there's a there's a, a basic kind of foundational thing within learning that there are two ways of approaching it. Either there's a cutoff point whereby you should have learned and know everything by this stage, which is the way our schools work. But actually, the way learning does work, different people learn at different rates. It depends where you started. And so we build that flexibility in so that, as Joe was saying earlier, it may take you longer between part two and part three to be ready for part three. And that's fine. We build that flexibility in because we recognize that that development will be different for different people. And we encourage you only to go to part three when you're ready so that you're more likely to pass. So if you're able to engage with you know, the, the, the way that we're, the, the learning is structured and to do the practice and you, know, you can allow that development to take place at the pace which is right for you then generally people do get through not everyone obviously but but in the main most people do yeah somebody's asked here how sorry jane carry on after you after well, somebody you. somebody's asked how the hg diploma can grow your practice if you're already working as um a, a, you know in, in mental health as a therapist or, or a counselor I think, you know, certainly what it did for, for my practice was that I, I was just able to work in a more structured way and um, with a almost like somebody giving me a map, you know, um, and what I found was just through word of mouth, the fact that I was getting um, good results, um, I, I didn't need to, to advertise, I didn't need to pay any fees for, for, for anything like that. I just found that, you know, that the, 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 my, my private practice just grew because of, of word of mouth, really. 
Mm. That tied in, funnily enough, to what I was going to say, because a okay. the common theme of questions that we had beforehand were, you know, examples of what people have gone on to do when they've done the diploma, where the backgrounds they come from, when people come from very wide background, like you're saying, we've had quite a few GPs, we've had psychiatrists, but we've also had hairdressers, paramedics, teachers, so it really is a broad yeah. people doing course and, on, and they go and, on to use it in very different ways, a lot of life coaches using it. Um, and a lot of people going into private practice and sort of linking back to people perhaps feeling a little bit worried about the exam I was one of those people who felt a little bit worried about the exam um quite a lot worried about the exam actually um and and that kind of led on to some interesting work didn't it Gareth yeah well so one of the things we, we did a little bit of practice work on on working with kind of things that um people were worried about um and so I did some practice on Joe in the part two as part of the practice. And um, it kind of unlocked. Uh, first of all, Joe was able to do her exam. But secondly, it got me really interested in exam anxiety, um, which then became the next kind of five or six years of my life was looking at exam anxiety and coming up with ways of of identifying it, treating it, improving it, helping students overcome it. And we ended up at the university we were working with at the time, developing a three session intervention which had a really, really high success rate at actually helping students overcome exam anxiety. People who were, you know, walked out of exams after 20 minutes, having not written a single thing, successfully sitting, passing and doing well on their exams. Um, and that just, it's, it's, you never quite know where that spark is going to take you to, you know, it's, it's, I would say I became a psychotherapist by accident and actually my career was an accident and I never planned any of it. One thing just opened up into the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So you never quite know where it's going to take you. And again, another good example of how it can develop your practice, because it took us both in in directions we never dreamt of going. And we spent a long time working with um, academic anxiety because of mm -hmm. because of it. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And there there are lots of um, somebody who's here asking about um, do we link or signpost to potential employers or is this up to students to set themselves up after the completion of the training? Um, we don't actually have any of that, but there are there are certain employers and, and organisations out there that take and are looking for human given therapists. Yeah. Suffolk Mind actually um, put a lot of people through our training and based their whole um, the whole organisation along what they call needs and resources and basically is human givens based and they they are often looking for human given therapists there's um, a cafe in Cardiff that's setting up they've been using human given therapists and because of that they want to to train more people up and get more human given therapists on board working with them they're trying to help homeless people and of course there's PTSD resolution yeah. which we really ought to acknowledge set up Absolutely. by HD therapists over 10 years ago and they work with um veterans and very difficult cases and they use solely human given therapists because they've proven um so effective at working with complex cases so there are there are lots of opportunities for work going through um once you've got the experience to work with clients at that yeah. level yeah and we're seeing more um you know universities um we more more colleagues in universities across the country working in university counseling services or university mental health teams so um, you you know, it, it, more and more we're starting to see people getting those positions. And as people start to understand the difference between PACP and PSA and things like that, um, it, we are seeing more and more people get that kind of work. And we've yeah. got various GP surgeries around the country who are making referrals mm. to human given therapists. Um, and I know that, you know, in, in Jersey and Guernsey as well, um, we've got practitioners who are who are working within um, surgeries down there um people working within the nhs um and and charity sector as well so absolutely i think i'm very mindful of the time actually we're running out a little bit so i think probably ought to go on to the the cost okay. a bit and we'll try and do some more questions at the end because there's a lot still coming through and actually before i, I say that the, the quite a few questions here um asking about specific things but especially people traveling from overseas how they can do it please do contact fiona heffernan or linda at the college office, um, you can contact them on admin at humangivens.com or phone us. Um, the telephone number will come through on the email, but it's also on the website, but it's 01323 811 And they're very, very happy to chat through and to work, work out what your diploma journey could look like. like. Um, and I, I know that Fiona's worked very closely with people coming over from France, Spain, wherever. Um, even Dubai, I think, to sort of work out a journey for you. So she's very happy to do that. In fact, you've got this bit first, Gareth. We need to whiz through, don't we? <laughs> yeah. So basically, this just comes back to, and we, we've we've talked an awful lot about a lot of this already in terms of what you're going to gain overall. Um, hopefully, what you'll find is certainly the students who who we teach 
feedback to us about what they've gained um, and that their knowledge base has, has really increased, that their own understanding of themselves and the people around them. Um, and many of our students say, take this off into all kinds of areas and all kinds of places and find that it really informs their practice overall. Um, some people develop their own private practice, some go and work in other areas, some use it in, in all kinds of environments. We've got our, our close colleague of ours, Carol Harper, who teaches the part three with me, who has done quite a bit of work in prisons, for instance. So there's a whole range of places where this can be used. Um, and I think it also informs all kinds of ways in which you'll see the world working around you, because we also talk a little bit more about how the world works around us. It's not just about therapy in a, in a little bubble separated from the rest of the world. We look at how the world works and, and what we can learn about all of that and, and understanding the world that we and our clients live in as well. Um, and then obviously you've got that, that professional accreditation at the end of all of that too. Yeah, absolutely. We've just a quick question here. Is there an upper age limit for taking the diploma? No, absolutely not. No, no, no upper age limit at all. No. And we have had um, some people who have retired and then come and done the diploma and then started working in various scenarios where they're working in uh, some in pastoral roles in churches or actually setting up private practices or, or, or setting up charities or working within charities. Absolutely not. No. Um, and, and the other thing as well is we're really keen on having as diverse a classroom as possible because th th that makes gives us more resource in the classroom. If you think about the way we think about resources in the human givens, we have more sets of resources in the classroom if we have that diversity because people are able to bring their own experience and we can it enriches the learning for everyone. So absolutely not. No, no upper limit whatsoever. And just finally, before we move on, just notice, can you work as a couples therapist taking the couples course as well? Um, yes, you can. We'd really recommend that you get, um, if you haven't already, a lot of experience of working with one person before you start working with two. But yes, absolutely, you can do couples work. Yeah, totally. Okay. Okay. There we go, Jane. Great, thank you both. Um, so this this one here, we'll send you through a link or I'll email, well put this diagram in the chat room on our website. We've got a lot of information, but it can obviously be quite hard to work your way through it if you're not familiar with it. So we've come up with this diagram, which hopefully encapsulates everything for the, the stages you've got to go through. So on the left there, you've got um, the attended workshops, the online courses, and a maximum price for those at the bottom, which is um, £3,384 for that part one. But we do regularly run offers and we've got a, an extra offer for you at the end of the minute. Um, some of our courses are reduced at the moment, the online courses, we've got them on offer. So we, we do do things so that that's the maximum you would pay for part two, part one, sorry. And um, moving on to part two, that's um, the price at the moment for that is, I think it's £3,984. Again, hopefully you can download this, my, my eyesight struggling there. Um, and this is this includes your um, all the training, uh, your course manual, which is a very comprehensive manual, which you need to read before you attend part two. We've had a question on the chat there actually asking, do you need to have done you know, when can you apply for part two? Do you have to have done all your part ones first? As, as long as you've completed all of your part one courses before you go on to your part two, that's fine. So you can apply if you've done, say, three or four part one courses and you know it's for you, then you can apply for your part two and, and get your name down on your preferred date. Because we do find that the part two courses fill up quite quickly. Um, so what I would always recommend is that you contact Fiona Heppinen in the office again um, and let her know if you're interested in doing the diploma so she's aware of you and she can help support you best work out your diploma journey and so forth. Um, once you've successfully um, passed part two um, and occasionally I think we sometimes there are conditions on there Gareth if, if little bits there on assessment mm. um, but you'd, you'd get um, when you're going through to that you get a you get um, detailed information student information about how that all works you've got after successfully passing part two you've got two years within which to take your part three um, occasionally people go over that and if they do then there are little bits of training that they might have to retake we'd look at look at that and to do it but that usually we find that people that's a long enough time for them to practice their um the skills that they've learned build up a client base and we do get some support in in um, with your supervisor in identifying the kinds of people to practice with and work build up some client base as gareth was saying earlier so that time there again 
that the, the length of time between part two and part three depends very much on your previous experience. Um, or if you're totally new to therapy, then you would probably take longer. You might might even take the full two years before you take your part three. Um, and you work very, very closely with the supervisor to, and, and yourself when they think you're ready. Um, it's not whether they think that you will definitely pass, but they think you're you're um, ready to take part three and you yourself are confident enough to take part three. Um, then put your name down for that there. So the cost working towards part three, as we were saying earlier, can be variable because that's the supervision elements. And it will depend very much on a case by case basis as to how much work you need, how experienced you already are, etc. cetera. Um, and the cost for part um, three is down there is that's a full intensive week of um, doing therapy sessions, assessment and so forth. And that's uh, 1,992 pounds for that assessment there but again if there's anything like this if you want to talk particularly about um costs the journey and so forth for your own individual circumstances do please call the office and or talk to fiona always email at admin at humegivens.com and we're more than happy to answer detailed questions so i hope that's so actually one question that comes up a lot is, is how long people typically tend to go through the diploma and this uh, an average I would say is two to three years really but sort of going through it but some some case occasionally somebody has been doing a lot of therapeutic work beforehand can do it quicker than that but it, it's you know the absolute minimum really is, is a year I would have thought to, to cram it all all the training in but it that can be done but it's if you're totally new to therapy we wouldn't recommend that we'd recommend you taking longer and as Gareth was saying really embed the learning and practice the skills I think that's um on there i think the next one is is the little offer i think isn't it joe that we've got for everybody tonight um as gareth was saying earlier uh, one of the really um great workshops to, to start and it's useful whether you carry on do the diploma or not is the therapeutic power of language workshop because that gives you a really good grounding in therapeutic skills language skills um solution focused techniques that's a really good grounding for whatever you, you go and do um and so we, we'd like to attendees tonight offer you 10% off that two-day course with that code there HGD10 um, and also if you wanted to try an online course they're currently on um, offer at 15% off but you can get an extra 15% off a course with the code HGD15 and we've also got at the moment a bundle offer which is on our website of if you if you know absolutely it's for you um, there's 20% off if you buy all online courses at once um, so again, we'll send that out in an email that's coming out after the event when we finish. So you'll get that all um, back in there. So I don't know, that gives us a, about nine minutes left to do a few more questions if I to rush through that. A, a <laughs> super important question that's come through a few times is um, some therapeutic training requires you to be in therapy yourself whilst training. Is this true for human givens? Um, it's really interesting. I've been having this conversation with colleagues in, in some of the other um, organising bodies, accrediting bodies that we're talking about, kind of in BSCP and UKCP. Some other therapeutic approaches do require that it's not a requirement for all others and it isn't a requirement for us. So what we basically say is, look, if there's something that you needs work, if you if you need therapy, then as a trainee or as a therapist, ethically, you should go and do that because you should be in a place where you have spare capacity when you're working with a client and you should be able to work with whatever a client is bringing into the room to present to you. So if you knew, know that there's something that if a client brought in and mentioned it to you, you would have difficulty or it would have an emotional impact on you, then it's important you go do go and do some work with that so that it's not interfering with the therapy that you're doing. But if there isn't something to work on, then you don't need therapy and you don't need therapy in order to be a therapist. There isn't really any good evidence from the research literature that having your own therapy makes you a, a better therapist, that it has any impact on your outcomes, unless there is something specifically there that really needs work. So it's about you as an individual and whether there's something there that needs work or whether there's something going on that you need to work on. Um, so, and if there is, then ethically you should do, but if there isn't, then, then we don't have it as a requirement. Mm, absolutely and in fact one of the earlier questions that I haven't had a chance to go back to is someone saying does it matter if you've had mental health problems yourself in the past I mean that can actually be give you real insight can't you but but we would obviously recommend that those problems have been effectively um they deal to, for you to be able to go on and help yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 you know, experience, you know, having had your own experience of, of, of accessing services and, and mental health and you know, absolutely can give you a degree of empathy and an ability to connect um, with other people. Um, but again, as, as Jin said, it's important that that's all been worked through for you and it's not something that you're still carrying uh, at that point. But but absolutely, there's no reason why, you know, having had those experiences that you can't go on and be a therapist and help other people. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, there was one thing here, the question from, <laughs> excuse me, from Paul is about, is there a role play on the part two? Do we have role play? I mean, you do, you do, they actually get to experience the, the role of being the therapist and, and Absolutely. being the client. So there is, that aspect does come into yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And part three again, of course. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's there's lot there's lots of skills practice. There's lots of role play practice that we we place an off a very high emphasis on that because that's how you then embed the skills and, and really build your learning and understanding of what it is that you're doing. So yeah, we don't we don't teach it and then leave you to figure it out for yourself. It's it's taught, then you get a chance to practice it, then you get come back and feed on what that felt like, and and we build and build and build, and you get lots of opportunities to practice those skills over and over. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Got another one here actually. Oh, sorry, I was going to say. Sorry, uh, yeah, <laughs> you was, I was going to say, um, save yours, but Harry is saying, is there CPD further training once you pass part three? Levels? That's my mind, Jane. That's what I was going to ah, say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're continually learning. And as Gareth was saying earlier, you know, it, it's our, our, our ethical duty, really, as a therapist to, to keep up to date um, with, with new findings. So we do run um, further CPD courses that are. are you know that are ongoing um and available to to everybody but we also run ones that are specifically for post part three um as well and um we you know we we have other um cpd opportunities as well within peer groups too yeah yeah there's lots going on i don't know have we mentioned peer groups and the support that, that there's a lot of support isn't there in the hd community yeah um, i was answering some questions so i might have missed it if you said that earlier we- we, we we did give a nod to the, yeah. the, the supportive peer group community, yeah. Right. Um, just one morning, what any of the other ones that came through earlier that are key. Um gosh, there's a lot here. Somebody did ask that if, if they're an accredited coach, do they have to do the yes. human givens diploma? If you want to be a human givens um accredited um therapist, counsellor, practitioner, um then then you do need to complete the diploma. Yeah. Yeah. But it, but again, it depends on how you want to use that. Because if Thank actually you. you just want to use it to top up your skills as a coach, then you can you can do as much of it as makes sense to you. Yeah, and it, you know that might be dipping into the the part ones. It might be coming all the way through part two, um, to to add into your skill set totally. But you don't necessarily have to go on then and do do part three if if you don't feel that you need to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we are we are finding a lot a lot of people coming through doing the whole diploma now, but it's it, that the model of the original thing was for it to be as flexible as possible. So we we try yeah. to keep that. But, you know, we, we we do have that that you know people come in and as Gareth was saying, take it out into to education, into into healthcare, into you know into business, into so many different arenas, into sports coaching as as well, mm. and into mm. into veterinary science. Um, yeah. So you know, we we we've got so many um, such diversity with within it, um, and you know, the, literally the the possibilities are pretty much endless with it. Really, yeah. it, it's applicable to to all walks of life. About being human, isn't it? And the pot your exactly. podcast that Joe does um, are a, a wonderful example. Actually, they give a real flavour of the different ways the um, human givens approach is being used by people, which is fantastic. Yeah. One question that I've just come up here actually that's just um, it is that keeps coming up a lot. Um, therapists best are human given therapists best described as counsellors or psychotherapists, and this is this is one that's been around for a while, isn't it? This yeah. Question. So there's no agreement on what those terms mean. Um, essentially, so there, and, and interestingly, even between the other kind of accrediting bodies, there is a huge discussion and, and debate about what they mean, what they don't mean, what they could mean, what they might possibly mean. So there, there isn't really a clear way, and and our, we have a very clear eye view of, of language and human givens, and we're very quick to recognize when words don't hold fixed meaning and, and to just acknowledge that and recognize that that's part of being human it's part of how we communicate it's not necessarily a problem but it is a thing and so we just recognize that, look, that they don't have fixed meanings those words and so we're quite comfortable with um trainees using either at this point now if, if at some point in the future in the uk someone decides to give them a fixed meaning mm-hmm. we'll do that i tend to describe myself as a psychotherapist because i think we tend to be more active in the room than people who would be, call themselves counselors probably are but that 
counselling itself is a very big church. Even person-centred counselling is a very big church. Some people are very active, some are not. So it, you know, it really depends on, 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 on what you're comfortable with or what works in the, in the environment that you're in is probably okay at the moment. It may change in future, but at the moment, uh, because they don't have fixed definitions in the UK, it might be slightly different elsewhere under different regulatory authorities. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, somebody was saying, you know, if you're not a, a therapist already, but you want to integrate the learnings into um, your business, how do you present the ideas that are given to you as you're not a qualified therapist? Um, and, and no, that's not a silly question. It's a really good question. But those are the sorts of things that you'll pick up on on the part ones um, that you're doing, because you'll you'll start to really absorb the language um, that, that we use and, and, and the way that we present things. Um, and it's really easy then to adapt that to your own um arena of work to then be able to go and perhaps go and give a presentation on the needs or a presentation on resources etc so and, and that is something that people do quite regularly so you know you, there'd be support there to help you um with that absolutely and there are lots of really good examples in the human givens journal um with lots of back issues and so forth totally. available online which which show exactly that how people have gone in using it with art therapy using it in even construction industry arts acting and so forth so again it's it's widely applicable isn't it um there's one um quite serious one question here that's just come in from quickly answer it saying if you have a client who you suspect has a personality disorder does an hg qualification qualify you to treat this client or should you refer the client further Oh, I'm really glad we we haven't got through the evening good, without me getting the chance to use my favorite good phrase, question. <laughs> which is it depends. So it really depends on your experience. Um, so I, I would say certainly as a trainee um, or as even as newly qualified, probably not. It's probably wise to refer on to somebody who's more experienced. But we do have qualified experienced human givens therapists who do work with people who have that label for whatever value that label has and, and, and do get results. It's probably a longer term piece of work um but absolutely you can do but but once you're qualified and once you've got some proper experience under your belt and and not working in isolation probably working with with, with other other people and, and yeah, totally. who might be around yeah. Mm, yeah absolutely well we've got to um 7 30 so i don't know if that's time to call it a day but i'd like to thank you both very very much and for everybody who stayed with us right to the very end, there's a lot of you still online, which is absolutely fantastic. A lot of people were, were online. Um, a recap, we'll send through uh, an email going out to you very, very shortly with a recap of the offers and also a lot of the useful links that we've got on here. Um, but we just want to say a big thank you to everybody for coming up. We're interested. We hope we'll see you soon on some of the training. But if you've got any more questions that we haven't answered, please do um, contact the office and they're very happy to help you and, and answer your point in the right direction. Hopefully you found it useful. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very, Thanks. very much.